Welcome to Lawmen, a podcast about local legends and obscure curiosities from days of yore. I'm Alistair Beckett King. And I'm James Shakeshaft. And James, I have another piece of Scottish hoax law for you today. Mm. A fraudulent fake stretching from Stirlingshire to the Bay of Honduras. Wow. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's, it's kind of the opposite of the adventures of William Adams, because, you know, that was a horrible voyage that turned out okay, yeah? Yes. Well, this is the tale of a voyage that seems okay and turns out really badly. Oh, let's check it out. It's the story of Gregor McGregor. So Gregor, they named him Gregor, <laughs> the Prince of Nowhere. Do you remember that the giddy thrill of April Fool's Day has worn off now? That was weeks ago from our point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you remember I was looking into Scotland's biggest hoax and I decided I thought it was probably the April Fool's Day Loch Ness prank? Yes, a lovely, a lovely hoax. It, it was a fine, a fine old hoax and no one got hurt apart from a few zookeepers in their feelings. And that bull seal. And one very large seal. Got hurt, was already hurt. Mm, had previously been hurt. Had previously been hurt quite badly. Well, in, in researching that, I discovered not Scotland's biggest hoax, but I think Scotland's biggest hoaxter Ooh. or perpetrator of hoaxes. And there's, a, there's obviously a lot of Scottish hoaxsters. There's wee Jimmy Cranky, well, Scotland's smallest hoaxster, probably. Not a real schoolboy. Anyone that tries to get an American to go on a haggis hunt. Yes, yeah, that's a classic Scottish hoax. Um, there's Michelle Moan, the Tory Baroness. Is she a big hoax? Well, first of all, I want to pronounce her name Michelle Monet, like Janelle Monet, so that's annoying. And I, I wanted to check for legal reasons that I wasn't going to be slandering her. So what she did was she claimed not to have a financial interest in a company providing what turned out to be useless PPE during COVID. Oh, but then it came out that her husband was paid £65 million. Pounds. But to be clear, for legal reasons, James, mm -hmm. when I say that she's a hoaxer, I mean that she also sold fake tan to Scottish people, perpetrating what is, in my opinion, the worst kind of fraud, implying that ginger people can get a tan. <laughs> uh, nice. And of course, the biggest trick the Scottish ever pulled was convincing the world <laughs> that the bagpipes was a musical instrument. These are just some amuse bouche Scottish hoaxes. That's a great one. I've got Alan McMasters for you. Have you heard of Alan McMasters? No. Alan McMasters. Have you heard of him, if I say it in the correct accent? It rings more of a bell, but no, no, I can't say I have. If you search using the search engine of your choice, James, who invented the electric toaster, you might still find websites saying it was a Scotsman named Alan McMasters in Year of Our Lord 1883. Oh, wow. Well, tell me what happened. Well, first of all, there is no such person as Alan McMasters. What? In, at least not in the year 1883. I thought it sounds like an obviously fake name. I've never heard the surname McMasters before. Mm. But the perpetrator of this fraud was none other than Alan McMasters <sighs> in the year 2012, year of our Lord 2012, as reported by BBC News and the Fortean Times. In 2012, a university student called Alan McMasters and his friends were lurking about, mm. as young people are wont to do, and they edited Wikipedia to say that he invented the toaster. A good old laugh. Oh, lovely stuff. Yeah. They just changed, I think originally they just changed one page. They just changed an already vandalised Wikipedia page, but the lie grew. And by the end of it, they'd created a whole page for Alan McMasters, who was born in 1865, with a really unconvincing, fakey black and white photograph, like torn around the edges in the photograph on Wikipedia. It's not convincing. Had they put the web page in the oven? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. What, did we talk about that in next week's episode? We did talk about that in next week's episode, yes. But you and me, James, we talked about it in the past, making little treasure maps. They've done the digital version of making a little treasure map by putting a piece of paper in the oven and then tearing the edges oh, when you're burning them. But take lovely care stuff. when you're burning the edges. Even better, the whole gag was busted by a schoolboy, by a Kent schoolboy called Adam. Whoa. Who told a BBC reporter, I don't know what Kent schoolboys talk like, so I'm, I'm assuming it's like, It didn't look like a normal photo. It looked like it was edited. Nice. So to begin with, Adam thought that it was just the photo was fake. But once he started pulling on the thread, the whole thing unraveled and eventually McMaster's came clean. But so many people had been taken in. It had appeared in newspapers. 
Alan McMaster's even made it onto the Bank of England's long list for people to appear on the £50 note. Wow. Admittedly, the long list had like a thousand people on it. It was a very long list, but it's still impressive that someone who doesn't exist got onto the list. Yes. So I just typed in Alan McMaster's and then it says Alan McMaster's first toaster as an option. I clicked on it, heart full of hope, top line, highlighted, Alan McMaster's did not invent the electric toaster. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> okay, debunked. Mm. Stamp. <laughs> Fake. <laughs> wait, are you wait, are you doing the are you doing the fact copyright? Steve yes. Stamp. When yes. you, like, it sounded like you were doing an impression of someone being cauterized with a No, it's the a brand. It's the Federation Against Copyright Theft. Fact. Yeah. So those are just a few Scottish hoaxers, but those are little tiddlers, James. Those are just a moose bushes if your bush is amused by a tiddler. None of those hoaxers compare to Sir Gregor McGregor, the Kazik of Poye. Or Poyez. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I definitely understood about a third of that, but All right. okay. a third, two thirds of that third was the word Gregor. <laughs> All right, <laughs> there's a lot of Gregor in this guy. He's very. It's going to be a very Gregor heavy episode. He's not the only guy in the episode called Gregor McGregor. So brace yourself. God, what unimaginative parents! So a Kazik is a Central American ruler or prince or king. Poye or Poyez. According to Lippincott's pronouncing Gazetteer, 1856, it's pronounced something like Poya. Poye? Po- I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Poye, because that's how I would pronounce it. Go on then. But James, we're not there yet. Let us travel back in time, you and I, just over 200 years. It's 1823. Oh, so we're 70 years away from the first toaster. Ah. (laughs) No, James, oh, it's gone in. It's gone in. He did not invent the toaster, James. You and me are aboard the Kennersley Castle, which is not a castle. It's a ship. That's why I said aboard. Yes. I'm going to need you on the ball here, James. Oh, this, this is a ship, not a castle. It's it's only going to get more confusing. Everything is confusing. Every noun is confusing. This story is set out to bamboozle and bewilder you. I need you to have your wits about you. Right, aboard, okay. The Kennersley Castle, not a castle. I will question everything. And we are among the 170 British settlers sailing from Leith Roads, which I'm so to inform you is not... It's not a road, it's a stretch of water. Oh my God. <laughs> we are bound for the Central American kingdom of Poye, Poye, whatever you want to call it. Right. You and me, James, we've got pretty high expectations. According to a passenger aboard this ship called Andrew Pickin, the capital city, St. Joseph, has a fabulous theatre, there's a cathedral, a government house, and a national bank. One of the passengers is expecting to become shoemaker to the princess of Poye, according to an article from the Manchester Guardian in 1823. And we are sailing with a massive box. I don't actually know how big it is. I just said it was massive for, co- for colour. With a box of Poye dollars that are going to pay our wages when we take up our new positions in this, f- this is a fantastic new colony. Now, we won't be the first British colonists to arrive. A ship called the Honduras Packet sailed in 1822 and took about 50 people ahead of us. Pretty sure Honduras is a country, isn't it, as well? Yeah, Honduras, I think, is a country, yes. And a packet is... It's not... Is it that a type it, of boat? Sometimes it means a ship, yeah. Oh, okay. A ship, rather. Sorry. Sorry, sea folk. It's not like a sachet. They're not just in a, in a little sachet. Right. Good. Not like Texas rub. Texan rub. What's that? It's, it's something you might get in a sachet or tub. It's, it's something you'd rub, rub into your meat or vegetables in order to give them a Texan flavour. I'd never rub a vegetable. <laughs> Fair enough. We've all read a book called Sketch of the Mosquito Coast, and this is going to really upset you, James, but it's not mosquito in the sense of insect. What? It's just a, it's just a name that sounds similar to mosquito. We've all read a book called Sketch of the Mosquito Coast, including the territory of Poye by a man called Thomas Strangeways, captain in the 1st Native Poye Regiment and aide-de-camp to His Highness Gregor Kazik of Poye. That's Poye, pronounced P-O-Y-A-I-S. I think that's how it's pronounced. Right. Okay. There's. I mean. There's a lot. There's a lot of words in there. There's a lot of words here. Basically, what's an aide de camp? I don't know. I. I. I think it's a military position. I, I imagine it's someone who helps around the camp. That sounds. Yeah. Basically, that book is an illustrated guide for settlers describing how verdant, fertile, and full of big lumps of gold and silver this place is. 
this place sounds great. Yeah, we are rubbing our hands together with excitement and anticipation. For the whole voyage? We brought some hand lotion. Yeah, the whole voyage, we are so chafed by the end of it. Get me a, get me a packet, get me a sachet of hand lotion. Uh, yeah, so the Mosquito Coast, the name is nothing to do with the insect. As Strange Ways is at pains to point out at the very start of the book, he says, perhaps few countries under the tropics are so little troubled with these disagreeable insects. Oh, this place sounds amazing. I think the name comes from Mosquito, which is an indigenous people of Nicaragua and Honduras. I can see how they were confused. The people of Poye are called Poyers, P-O-Y-E-R-S, and they were apparently very keen to have British settlers arrive and pay them extremely low wages as farmers. Mm. Just absolutely thrilled at the prospect of doing that. Now, I want to stop you there because I can hear your eyes squinting, James, with scepticism. It is normal these days to regard British settlers in a colonial context as the bad guys. Yes, because of all their murders and that. Yeah, because of historical facts. Mm. But James, I ask you, what if this story had an even badder guy? Oh. Mm. It's been a long voyage. We've arrived at last in Poye, at the mouth of the Black River. And James, there's no welcoming party. What? There's no port. There's no capital city of St. Joseph. There's no theatre. And no locals have ever seen Poye dollars before. Who am I going to make these shoes for? Absolutely no one, James. What? I'm sorry to tell you. This is the this is Willie's chocolate experience all over again. Just, I beg your pardon. But if you can remember her expression from that photograph, the Oompa Loompa's expression, you've maybe got a sense of the expression of the um, 250 settlers who sailed for Poye, only to find out that there wasn't really anything there in the way of a settlement. Not even two jelly beans and a quarter cup of lemonade. You don't, I don't think you've even got any jelly beans. I, I don't know how to do this transition because we are having a good laugh about yeah. this. But of those 250 settlers, about 170 of us are going to die of malaria or drowning. So there, so there are mosquitoes for a start. Yeah, there actually are quite a lot of mosquitoes in this place, uh, even though that's not where its name comes from. Ah, but the guy was lying when he said there weren't many mosquitoes. I mean, that's not the biggest lie that I think that person put in their sketch. The guy wasn't even lying. The guy might not even exist. Thomas Strangeways might not be a real person. That's a, such a legitimate name. It's a real suspicion-inducing name, but it feels like a double bluff, because if you've called your guy Strangeways, no one's going to think you made that up, because it's too weird a name. A couple of sources here, if you want to know more about what happened to the settlers, you can read Sir Gregor McGregor and the Land That Never Was by David Sinclair, which is from 2002, I think. Mm. And you can read James Hastie's first-hand account of the voyage of the Kennersley Castle. He was a sawyer on board. He's one of the people who eventually came back to England to tell the story. Honestly, the story of the settlers struggling to survive without any experience or training or abilities to survive on a, a sort of rugged coastline with nothing... They're a bit too miserable to relay in great detail on a humorous podcast, on what is essentially a humorous podcast. Yes, yes. Okay, I think we get the uh, we we can get the gist. They were they were. It's like an absolute worst case scenario of going to an air an Airbnb hoax, like yep, like mm -hmm. that. But also it the town that your Airbnb in doesn't exist. Exactly, and I'm guessing the country doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. The country doesn't exist. Yes. It's like Tough Mudder meets It's a Knockout meets Taskmaster, but just worse than all of those put together as an experience to go through. Basically, if you've no experience building canoes, it turns out it's very hard to build a canoe to paddle all the way to Belize in. So did they get dropped off or did they at least have the boat they went on? It, uh, infuriatingly, they did get dropped off. <gasps> Yeah, so the, the the same thing happened with the, the first ship, the, the Honduras packet dropped 50 people off and then sailed away, and ag again, the um, the Kennersley Castle dropped them all off and then sailed away without any of them. Was the, were the captains, I'm presuming this is a scam or possible scamola, were the captains in on this, <laughs> or were they just... I don't, I don't think they were, but may, it's very unclear how many people were in on the scam. It might just have been Gregor McGregor himself. So here's what I think was true about McGregor. He's described as being a Scottish adventurer, which is 19th century code for bastard. <laughs> he was he he seems to actually have been a descendant of Rob Roy, 
McGregor, the famous Rob Roy. Just because that will be bleeped. It wasn't the worst word, but it may as well have been. It was, but it, well, I mean, yeah, it wouldn't, it, it deserves it. Gregor McGregor, who was a descendant of Rob Roy, the Rob Roy McGregor, off of history, one of the children of the mist, if you remember that name. The McGregor clan was famously proscribed and banned in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Uh, McGregor was born in Glengyle on the shores of Lake Katrine in the Trossachs. Yeah, hear you. In the Trossachs. I can't know how to pronounce that in a way that makes it simultaneously accurate and saucy. <laughs> So the McGregor clan had been banned by King James in 1603 and then finally restored in 1774, thanks to Gregor McGregor, oh. A, oh. a different one. Ah. This is Gregor the Beautiful McGregor, who was our Gregor McGregor's granddad. Right, okay. So not, you know, not not a big time aristocrat, but he had a, you know, a fairly classy sounding lineage in Scotland. He'd fought in the British Army and in the, I think, the Portuguese Army and in the Venezuelan War of Independence. And George Frederick Augustus I, who is the Mosquito King, the uh, the indigenous king of an area in the Honduras Bay. I'm not sure how much power the kings had or whether they were sort of symbolic figures that the British colonial forces sort of worked with, but it, it, it's not clear. But apparently, George Frederick Augustus I had granted some land to him on the coast. Whether he actually had the power to do that, whether anything was actually signed, it doesn't seem to be clear. But he does seem to have actually said, you can have some of this land. Pretty much everything else seems to have been a lie. So I introduced him as Sir Gregor McGregor. He, he was called that because he claimed to have been knighted by the King of Spain. And of course, he was a knight of the Order of the Green Cross in Poyet. And so in Britain, he was allowed to call himself Sir Gregor, even though he had never been knighted by the King of Spain. Bain. Thomas Strangeways either didn't exist or was in on the scam. There's no record of a soldier called Thomas Strangeways, as far as I know. And James, brace yourself here. The Manchester Guardian, again, on the 25th of October, 1823, described McGregor, yeah. brace yourself, as a person of whom we do not choose to say all we think. Oh, so they've sort of bleeped themselves. Yeah, very exactly. Much there. That is Victorian euphemism for... <laughs> That's how you, that's what you said in the that's what you said in those days. Mm. So he seemed very convincing. He had all that Rob Roy stuff going on, and he had loads of fake documents, like that book about the coast. Nobody would write a massive book describing a place in enormous detail if that place didn't exist. Surely not. He had a proclamation he had written to the inhabitants of the territory of Poyer, the Poyers, and who, who I will remind you don't exist. But the weirdest thing about the proclamation is that he starts every paragraph with. Poyers with an exclamation mark. Right, just to remind people that yes. they exist. <sighs> but I can't help reading it in the sort of the rhythm of the way the village people say, young men, <laughs> Poyers, I now bid you farewell. <laughs> Poyers. On the 29th of April, 1820, the King of the Mosquito Nation, by a deed, executed at Cape Gracias a Dios, granted to me and my heirs forever the territory of Poyer. It doesn't work as well. Poyers, it should be my constant study to render you happy. And Poyers, you definitely exist. You definitely <laughs> exist. Bam, bam. Please come to stay in my real country. <laughs> it's definitely a real country. <laughs> it wasn't a real country. <laughs> no. Ah, so he was pretty successful, remarkably, really, mm. uh, when it came to selling fictitious tracts of land. That said, people buy stars, don't they? And they buy plots of land on the moon. But they don't actually then go there. Yeah, they don't buy tickets. Well, actually, people do buy tickets to the moon. Yeah, they don't just go there. It, it started out really well. But, but he had a bit of trouble when it came to selling government bonds because there was a stock market wobble. In Poyer. And investors... Well, in South America, in South and Central America in general. So basically nobody was buying anything because they got a bit worried. Mm, that some of the places didn't exist. Well, maybe because, yes, people were starting to make their way back from Poyer and the news that there was nothing there. It's rubbish. Returned. It's rubbish. Along with the, <laughs> the fact that the Mosquito King withdrew the grant of land that he had given to McGregor. So he left Britain and went to Paris, having told people he was going to Italy for his wife's health. I don't think his wife's health was even in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, he acted like a very innocent person would. Mm-hmm. But he was surrounded by seemingly respectable military men. His charge d'affaires, or deputy ambassador, was Major William John Richardson, and he was closely associated with Captain Gustavus Butler Hippersley. Oh. Who ended up being arrested with him in France. Uh-oh. More scam, same scam, 
this time in France. I think he might have started styling himself as president of Poyer by this time rather than Cazique. Either way, he was arrested by the order of the famous criminal turned criminologist Eugene Francois Vidoc. I'm not aware of them. Neither was I, but he's 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 a whole podcast in himself. He was the inspiration for various literary characters, including Edgar Allan Poe's Auguste Dupin. Oh. Yeah, so he's he like invented the concept of the detective. French for summer bread. <laughs> he arrested McGregor, and McGregor was charged with fraud mm. for, um, you know, for committing fraud, really. Presumably selling people tickets there and... I don't, he didn't... To, he, he, he was given a lot of credit because the, the men who were travelling did have to pay. The women and children were allowed to go for free. He paid the fares for the women and children going there. So he was regarded as very generous at the time. After a lot of legal wrangling in France, he was eventually acquitted after solemnly giving his word that he'd done nothing wrong. And that seemed to be enough for the magistrate. That's just, that seems, I mean, more maybe more people should do that. Basically, I think he pinky sweared his way out <laughs> of prison in France. So uh, David Sinclair, who wrote the wrote the book on this, reckons that John Richardson and Gustavus Hippersley were una genuinely unaware of the fraud and were taken in by McGregor, even while... Hippersley was arrested and, and, and you know incarcerated with him in France. Not the comedian John Richardson. He was not involved no, as far as we major, know. No, major major William John Richardson, sorry. The Chargé d'affaires Richardson. The Chargé which is French for price of a fare. So it sounds implausible that these guys could not have known that it was a scam. Mm. Until you read James Hasty's account. Do you remember James Hasty, the sawyer who was with us on the boat? He was the actual eyewitness sort of thing. He was the guy who was actually there throughout the whole thing. He had a terrible time. He made it back to Britain, still feverish with malaria, and testified in front of the Lord Mayor, shivering with I don't I want to say ague. I don't really know what ague is. Malaria. Malaria. I thought it was pronounced egg. Maybe it is. No, it isn't. I'd say it in a play and they didn't tell oh. me till afterwards. That it wasn't <sighs> pronounced egg, it was pronounced ague. The next day when the stories appeared in the paper, Hasty was incensed by how bad they made McGregor look. Right. So James Hasty, who went through all of this, was convinced that Gregor McGregor had done nothing wrong. What? He, yeah, he and the other settlers signed and published an affidavit insisting that McGregor, His Highness the Kazik, was innocent of any wrongdoing. They blamed everything on General Hector Hall, who was the man who was supposed to be the governor of the settlement when they arrived. And there wasn't anything there. Probably imaginary. No, Hector Hall was a real person. And I, and I, think, I think he died in Belize after they were, they were rescued and taken away from the coast. So was he on one of the boats? Yes. So he, he went there totally convinced, just like everybody else, but quite quickly twigged that they had been scammed or possibly defrauded. Scammed yeah, 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 exactly. But a convenient person to put the blame on since he was dead. Mm. So Hasty was convinced that, you know, that oh, the person who told us about the theatre was uh, Andrew from from the ship. So it wasn't actually the the Kazik. Gregor McGregor didn't actually personally lie to us. So he he believed that it was all a, you know a genuine attempt to settle a, a Central American nation. So nobody was a more staunch defender of Gregor McGregor than James Hasty, and few people had been so badly wronged as James Hasty. So maybe the, the people he was working with did believe him as well. He was obviously a very convincing kind of a guy. What? It's extraordinary. It's a, then he's at the very least mass, like, unfit to do the job, whatever it is, this job is of him, of trying to get people to go to a country, to settle a Some country. Some of the worst Kaziking I have ever seen. Yes, yes. His Kazik technique leaves a lot to be desired. Kazik technique. Yeah, a phrase I just invented to describe being a Kazik. That's a good first album. Well, if this were a true crime movie, then it would end with a montage of all the main players and you would find out what happened to them. It would like freeze frame. I'm guessing by now, but fingers crossed, no offence, they're all dead. They are, thankfully, all dead. It was 200 years ago. Otherwise, they're, they're, they're in a lot of pain. Yep, if there's any justice. <laughs> uh, so, freeze frame on the Mosquito King, George Frederick Augustus I. Yep. Murdered. <gasps> Possibly strangled to death by one of his wives. Oh. In an unrelated wife murder. Mm -hmm. Good for her. <laughs> Fair play. Eugene Francois Vidoc, mm -hmm. the criminal turned police chief. What happened to him? Freeze frame. Did he start a little bistro and then kind of solve crimes on the side? Kind of. I think you're describing the plot of Pie in the Sky. Yeah. But in actual fact, he, yes, 
he left the police force and became a private detective after he was sacked, as far as I can tell, on suspicion of committing the crimes that he was solving. Oh. Because he was a criminal turned police officer and he hired loads of other criminals to be police officers. And the people who were accused of those crimes said that they were being framed by the criminal turned police people. Right. So it was it wasn't the sort of the the rags to riches redemption story. It was the a, a, a tale of horrible corruption. A mysterious and interesting fellow. We ha- can't possibly do him justice in this story. End of freeze frame. <laughs> Gregor McGregor, freeze frame. What happened to him? Well, after France, he returned to Britain, where he was briefly arrested without charge and held in Tothill Fields Bridewell. So he was briefly arrested in Tothill. He was he he was briefly arrested without charge and held in Tothill Fields Bridewell, but they let him go. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a humorous political satirical cartoon of him in prison going, Aah! and his shadow looks like the devil. Uh, yeah, I imagine he's trying to like tell his cellmate that there's another, there's an extension <laughs> to the cell. It's got an en suite. He retired to Venezuela with many people still believing his lies. And when he died in 1845, he was given a war hero's burial. James, he literally got off scot-free. Oh. And he was Scottish, so that's a bit of wordplay for you there. Yeah, that is good. That's good. I appreciate the wordplay. I appreciate the wordplay. Do not appreciate that man's crimes. It kind of makes you think, what if all the other colonial enterprises were in some way immoral? Mm. What, what, would, what kind of world would allow that to happen? So that is the story of Gregor McGregor, the Prince of Nowhere. Oh, that's a lovely name and a lovely story. Thank you very much. Hor- horrible story. Quite good name. Well, it's horrible because it's true, but it was yeah. nicely told. <laughs> It's horrible. It's horrible because it's true. Is what you say when like a horrible comedian is doing jokes. <laughs> you're like, eh, it's horrible because it's true. So yeah, there's loads, loads of detail I haven't gone into there. If you want to read it, listener, you can check out David Sinclair's book. But it is sad. Sad. There's some sad bits. I've skipped. I skipped over those. Do you want to do the scores? Yeah. All right. Unfortunately and annoyingly, this was all. This was historic fact. Ay, ay, ay. And lies aren't supernatural, but I'm going to go with it first category supernatural. This, this is history. This is very much the obscure history bit. It, of yeah, our it's an remit. obscure curiosity. It is from days of yore, but it is not actually magical or full of ghosts. No. I was, is there, I mean, was there anyone at any point say, that it was one of those places that vanish or, you know, like a fairy kingdom or was it just too grimly real? No, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's a fun kind of vanishing kingdom. I think it's more of a kingdom that was made up. Yay, yeah, yeah. So I, I, have we ever given naught before? I don't think we, I don't know. I don't I know. Think it's going to be a naught. I think it has to be. I think it has to be. It has to be naught. There was nothing super, no. a- oh. I mean, there was nothing supernatural in it. No, and I, yeah, I'm sorry. I think that is a naught. Oh, okay, all right. I, I knew it going in. I, I wanted to do it. I knew it didn't have anything supernatural in it. Mm. I brought this on myself. Mm. All right, second category, names. Right then. Okay, yes, lots of... The Mosquito King, Eugene Francois Vidocq. Mm-hmm. Gregor McGregor, grandson of Gregor McGregor. Gregor McGregor 1 and 2. Gregor McGregor to... To Gregor to McGregor. Uh, Tommy Strangeways. Yes. Gustavus Butler Hippersley. Lovely. And not the... Oh, yes. (laughs) Yes. William John Richardson, not John Richardson, the comedian. Yes. Uh, That was a lot. And of course, really the rudest name you can call someone, a person of whom we do not choose to say all that we think. Mm -hmm. Mm. The wildly inaccurate names from the beginning... Of course, which led, you know, the the Leith Road. Quite, yeah, Leith Road, the, the castle. That castle that was also a boat. I think it's, it's good. Alan McMasters. Alan McMasters. And a lot of them were created, which kind of... Janelle Monet. Um, a lot of them were, were made up. So that kind of, in a way, that gives it a bit of an extra edge because they were intentionally created. Yeah. I mean, obviously, parents intentionally create names for their children, but that's not the point I'm making. So it's going to be a four. A four? I thought after the zero, you were going to give me a sympathy five. I feel bad about the... Well, it, I mean, there wasn't anything hilarious, so I was thinking no. that's a sympathy four. Oh. 
<laughs> okay. I mean, I didn't even mention Lippincott's pronouncing g- Gazette. <laughs> I can't even, still can't say it. It's such a hard publication to say. <laughs> Lippincott's pronouncing Gazette. <laughs> all right. All right. Fine. <sighs> You've been so tough with me this time. Yeah. Well, it's hardened me, the the tale, the tale of... Yeah. Mm, You're cynical now, sceptical. It's made me feel a bit sad. I'm trying to get the justice that the the cond deserved by giving you a bad score on a podcast. It's the least. It's literally the least. Yeah, that that could be done. Yeah. All right. Next category. Mm -hmm. Gregor, he enchants. Oh. Wordplay. On like Gregorian chants, Gregor he enchants. Thank you. I I could see in your face that you hadn't got that. Yes. So like Gregorian chants type of type of singing listener, and Gregor he enchants. That's the name of the category. That's very nice. And I haven't really got much to back this up, except I thought that would be enough to carry me to a five. Uh, well, he managed to enchant at the very barest minimum two boats load of people. Into 250 people, uprooting yeah. their lives and moving to a place that didn't exist. I mean, it's not enchanting when you tell it back. Believing him while he was in prison for being a fake? Yeah. He still seems to have believed him. Even one of the direct victims. Even the victim came back and said, no, leave him alone. No, I think it was probably one of the other conned people that I fell out with on the boat. Well, yeah, it is a five. He clearly had a talent for something, didn't he? Yeah, they didn't even mention the scam in the papers when he died. Yeah, it is, it is a five, definitely. Yes, finally! Well, I dedicate this five to the victims. Mm. Final category, it's like NFTs if NFTs could give you malaria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, that's a very good point. I hope they weren't all dressed as grumpy apes. <laughs> As annoyed monkeys or whatever it was. Do you remember? It was such a big deal. Everyone was like, oh, it's the future. On both but sides, it, it was such a big deal, though. Like, people going there and other people going, this is, what are you doing? <laughs> like, really going on about it. It was ridiculous, but it was kind of the people going on about it ridiculous didn't help. Don't right-click and save my imaginary Central American nation. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Ah, oh, yeah. That it, I mean, it is a hundred percent. I can't. I can't say anything less than a five for that. So, what would hundred percent be if you expressed it in terms of an out of five, James? It would be a five. All right, thank you. You and you can right click and save on that five. I'm. I tell you what, I'm giving that five to the world. Thank you. I'm. I'm locking it away in the blockchain. It's an open source score. Oh wow. What a what a terrible man! Really, yeah, very very hot, very unpleasant Scottish man. Is there any like idea about like his his motivation or anything? Like, I'm paraphrasing the summary from David Sinclair's book here from memory, but he reckons that that Gregor McGregor didn't leave an awful lot of documentation of his internal thoughts. Right, most of his writing is sort of in character writing. And also things that are like anonymous letters to the newspaper in defense of himself and things written by Thomas Strangeways and other things, you know, which are all probably written by him. Like fake Twitter So we accounts. don't really know. Yeah, like sock puppet accounts. We don't really know what he, what he was like as a person internally. We know he, he seemed to stay loyal to his wife who followed him around even when she wasn't really ill and was having to go to Italy and that sort of thing. Well, she wasn't really in Italy. She wasn't in Italy. She was, she was, in, she was with him. But we, yeah, we don't really know what his motivation was, except that he quite liked people giving him money. Just, just scammed, just a scammer. But he can't possibly have thought it would work. That's the thing. Mm. When the, he must have known that when the boats arrive, ships. I know they're called ships. He must have known that when the big boats arrive, people would say, "Hang on." They would start to rumble it at that point. Did he think that if he, it was like, well, if I tell him, someone will have some you know, some nouse and they'll build their own city, like a sort of fire festival thing. I think maybe he thought, yes, if he'd managed to keep selling bonds and raise loads of money, maybe the idea was fake it till you make it. Mm. Maybe he was going to like Theranos his way out of this situation. I don't know. There is an advert on YouTube. For the island? Don't, a- Alistair, don't buy it. <laughs> it's it, There's an advert for the Republic of Poye saying, come to the Republic of Poye. Go to www.republicofpoye.org. But that website doesn't exist. I was, is it not Rick Roll? Is it like the ultimate, <laughs> is it Rick Astley's website? A 
Well, thank you for listening to that horrible tale. If you would like disgusting extras and sad bonus material... Yeah, go to patreon.com forward slash lawmenpod. You get access to the extras. That went very local then. You can get access to the extras. You can sleep in my barn. (laughs) (laughs) You can join the Law Folk Discord. And, best of all, you can support the podcast. Yes, of course. And thank you very much to all the people already doing that. And thank you very much to Joe for editing this. Cheers, Joe. It wasn't an easy one. No. Thank you very much for listening. Please leave us a review and rate us five stars. We don't accept less. If you want to see us do this live, Lawmen Live in Oxford on the 25th of May, 2024. 2024. And I mean, just Google Lawmen Oxford podcast live. You'll find it. Yep. We'll all look at the link in the notes. That might be easier. Just Google who invented the toaster. And then oh, so, just yes. Have a bit. Click the hyperlinks until you get to us. Mm-hmm.